Thank you. If you have your Bible, would you turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, as you can already tell, old school Bob is in the house. All right, got the old whiteboard out here. So um, I'll try to update myself one day. I'm just having a hard time doing it, okay? So just let me catch up to you all in this room. I, I, I want us to conclude our series of messages on the kingdom. I was really stirred when I began to contemplate um, in our transition team, what is the meaning of, of, of the kingdom? We, we were assigned to talk about and to explore and to determine what was our kingdom objectives. And I began to really look really carefully in my own life and, and carefully in my leadership and carefully uh, for our church as we position ourselves to understand the merit of the kingdom. And I was deeply consumed uh, by a verse that often we, um, uh, we quote, uh, maybe even teach our children uh, through song in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, right, where, uh, where the scripture says, uh, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Now, we've taken a lot of time to develop this through the last eight weeks because we want this to be the centerpiece of whatever the future may be holding uh, for New Hope Church. We want to be sure uh, that we are kingdom-minded, kingdom-driven uh, people and, and that we are on objective and aligned with the perfect will of God. Now, as we complete our, uh, our series of messages that falls on the fifth Sunday, and only the Lord could have planned this out, we, this just shows his sovereignty, how God works, and even when we don't uh, comprehend or behold it. And, and because we, all, we, we always uh, celebrate the observance of the Lord's Supper on the fifth Sunday, uh, this is the perfect time to cap our series of messages uh, on, the, um, on, on the kingdom. Uh, it, we're we're going to be looking in, in, in Luke chapter 22, and as we do, um, I want to uh, give you a little bit of a, a holistic look, a helicopter look at the Scripture as to how, why this is so essential, why this is so important, and why it is that we need to focus our attention upon what Jesus tells us in this passage, especially in relationship to one particular uh, cup of the kingdom. So with your Bibles open to Luke chapter 22, I'm going to invite you now, if you will, to turn with me over to verse 15, and we'll, um, and we'll start reading together. If you will, you can join me as we stand to our feet as we reverence the reading of the Word of God. Anybody bring their Bible today? Some folks are brought That's great. So proud of you. Way to go. Here's what the Scripture says. And he said to them, that's Jesus, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you, before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, that's a key, after the supper, he took the cup, the cup of which we'll be celebrating in a few moments, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart will be pleasing in your sight as my God, my rock, and my king. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you may be seated. I want to go to my, my board here real quick, okay, because I, I want you to see, and we've talked about this before, so I'm not going to elaborate on a whole bunch, okay? Uh, you can kind of scroll back into our archives and, and, and maybe pull it up. But you see, when Jesus gets to this place in Luke chapter 22, this is something that is, uh, the, everything in history moves toward this point, okay? Everything uh, the, in, in God's divine sovereign plan now is moving toward this point. Uh, this is where the Lord Jesus now in the very last hours of his life is, uh, is now telling his men in a symbolic way as he's been teaching them throughout years that indeed the Son of Man or the King, the King is going to lay down his life. The King is going to forfeit his life. He's going to lay down of his own. No one's going to take it from him, but he's going to do it on his own. Now this, of course, is the whole accumulation of, of, of biblical history and even before so. Uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that before the foundations of the earth were ever laid, uh, that the Lord had this divine design 
uh, in his mind and his heart for each and every one of you. Now, for us to really un understand the scripture, to really see how it, how it timetables out, we've been looking at some things, but let me go back to something that we started with uh, some months ago when we talked about the seven feasts of Israel, okay? I told you that if you could master Leviticus chapter 23, you probably could understand all of the Bible. And you see, most of us, because we think Leviticus is such a boring book, it, it, it's so filled with details that so, are, are so archaic and so old and so, uh, uh, you know, so historic that they really have no, no meaning. I want you to know something about your Bible, okay? In your Bible, every word of your, of your Bible is inspired by God. And that doesn't mean that I understand every word. That doesn't mean that I comprehend everything that God says. But when the Lord tells me something, especially through his word, I want to pay attention. So if it's in his word, I want to pay attention. And so in Leviticus chapter 23, we get this picture of the of the festivals. Now there are two, uh, two categories of festivals. There's the spring festivals, uh, which are usually March, April, May, and then there's the fall festivals that normally begin around September. Uh, and by the way, when September rolls around in our church, I'm going to preach through these festivals right here so that you can get a holistic pi picture as to what God is teaching us and what he wants us to know about his divine timetable. Table. Now, God doesn't do things uh, by a, a sense of, oh, okay, all right, I, I'm going to adjust. God doesn't do things except that, uh, that, that fulfill his perfect plan. There's no, no mistakes with God. God doesn't sit upon his throne thinking, oh, man, I'm going to scratch my head. I got to think that thing over. I mean, look, look what's going on in this world, you know. I got to kind of catch up to what's happening. He, he's, he's got a perfect plan. It's immovable. It's immovable. And so he symbolizes to us the, the, the work of grace of which Jesus is now picturing with his men is going to be completed, okay? Now, we've talked about the spring feast of Passover. Passover is, uh, is, it was, was practiced on the 14th of Aviv. In other words, it was, uh, it was the second week uh, into the new year of, the, uh, of, of God's people. Uh, th th this is the time you remember that uh, uh, Moses was instructed to tell his people that they were to slay a lamb, right? And they were to choose it on the 10th day of the month that it was going to become a pet in their home. They, they would give it a name. They would become familiar. They would get attached. And all of these things would happen because it's symbolic is that when the Lord Jesus came into the world, he did the very same thing. Man, he attached himself to us. We were drawn to him. You know, we, we, we knew him by name. And he was the perfect Lamb of God. And you remember that uh, the, the Lamb of God on the Passover was uh, was hoisted up, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the true Lamb of God, the ones that Moses said, now take these perfect lamb, uh, this perfect Lamb uh, without blemish, very young. And and really the positioning of that uh, of that Lamb was, was like this, much like a cross. You're to take uh, that blood, remember this, right? And you're to take the blood and you're to paint it over the doorposts, and so over the over the ledger over here, on the side post over here, and also through the entrance access over here. So we see the even an emblem of the cross when we think about the Lord Jesus. So the Bible tells us that the blood of the Lamb was placed over the doorposts of the Israelites so the death angel would pass over them because the blood had been applied, right? I mean, we get that. We see that. It makes sense to us, right? And so it's a wonderful picture that God has given to us because he wants us to know that what has happened is not something that just, oh, okay, I got to take care of this, okay? Oh, I, I, uh, I got to address this. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, he has a perfect plan that he has leveraged in time so that we could see his grace absolutely fulfilled. Now, there's many more things that we could say about Passover, but it is also, uh, the, the, the day of Passover is followed by what's called the seven days of unleavened bread. And when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ because he has delivered you, because he has uh, hoisted himself up upon a cross, he, he permitted this. Uh, he allowed this. Uh, he expected this. He emptied himself, the Bible says, from all his divinity, and he took upon himself the form of a slave, is what the scripture says. And when he does it, the Bible says that, uh, man, everything above the earth, everything upon the earth, everything below the earth is going to proclaim, it's going to declare that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, that he is king of all, that he is Lord of all, that he has given himself for us. And so because he has given himself for us, he is the perfect lamb of God, unleavened, not leavened bread. Now, this is unleavened, completely pure. And so when you and I come to know the Lord, Jesus Christ, what happens in our lives? It's not always instantaneous, all right? It doesn't happen always in a moment, but God begins to work a progressive consecration in all of us. Now, there's a big Bible word in this, so don't miss it, okay? Uh, it's sanctification. Don't let, you, don't let your tongue trip over that. It's a real simple word. 
It just simply means that the more you know him and the more that you, have let, you allow him to have access into your life, guess what? You become the fulfillment of Romans chapter 8, verse 29, where the Bible says, to whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. So when you became a believer, God's program shot into action, and now he's purifying you. He's consecrating you. He's sanctifying you. He's making you everything that he wants you to be. And that takes time, doesn't it? It takes time. So I'm thankful that the Lord's given me many years to get it right, you know, before he calls my name and I go home. Some of you are going to get it right quicker than me, and God's going to call you home, and you're going to get to go to the party before I do. So unleavened bread. And then first fruits. This is a picture of the perfect Lamb of God having given himself without sin. He's the first fruits in resurrection. Jesus was the first to defeat death. Everyone that dies, dies. And even those that Jesus resurrected died again. And remember this principle when Jesus said that, that he said to Nicodemus, you, 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 you have to be born again. And it's a word that means you must be born from above. There's nothing that you can do. There's no work that you can do to make yourself justified before me. There's no act, that, no, no moralism. There, there's no legalism. Uh, there's no religiosity. Uh, there's no church membership. Uh, there's nothing that you can do. There's no routine that you can do to catch my favor I'm going to favor you because I love you. And by the way, part of my favor is I'm going to raise you from the dead like I have been raised from the dead. And for those that, uh, he, he, that Jesus raised, man, Lazarus was going back in the tomb. Okay? That, that young boy at Nain that uh, Jesus raised off that, that coffin, he went right back into the tomb. It just took a little bit longer. And guess what? When God says that you and I will have the hope of redemption, there will come a time count on it. There will come a time that your body may, may be put into the earth and your spirit will be joined to him, but there'll come a time that your glorified body and your eternal spirit will together be with him forever in the kingdom. This is a picture of the Lord saying, I have triumphed over everything. So we don't follow a hollow God. You see, we don't follow an empty deity. We do not follow someone that just was a moralist, a great teacher. When people say, man, Jesus was a great teacher, they don't know anything about who Jesus was. Because if they followed the teaching of the teacher, they would believe in what the teacher taught is who he was. Who he was. So the day of Pentecost, of course, is 50 days removed from Passover. Penta, 5, 50, 50 days. It's the counting of the Omer. We've talked about all of this. And, and, and on that day, the Bible says that he who came to us as Emmanuel offered himself up, rose again from the dead, now gives to us his permanent presence by his abiding and dwelling Holy Spirit. Now catch this. The king loves you so much that rather than you live your life on your own strength, that he indwells you with his powerful, mighty, overcoming Holy Spirit so that you can overcome, so that you can live not by the meagerness of your own abilities, not by the eagerness of our own uh, uh, practicing carnality, but instead we, we are obviously saying, Lord, listen, we, we need you. We can't do anything apart from you. Listen, this is the one thing I learned the very first time that we had our first child. I mean, when, when, when Seth came into the world, the first thing I did when he came home was I knelt by his little crib. It wasn't a crib, it was a cradle. And I, I knelt and I remember weeping and I said, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. And then for the next 18 years, I proved it. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. You, know, you guys are laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been there. Have you ever been to that place where you knew that you were totally, completely helpless, that you couldn't control it, you know, that you couldn't kind of fashion it and make it and squeeze it and form it, but you had to say, Lord, you know what? It's got nothing to do with me. Pentecost gives to every one of us that when we gather together that this is not routine, that when we gather together that the Holy Spirit who is indwelling all of us, who continues to own more of us, why? Because he is the king and he is Lord over us. And can you imagine what will happen in the church when every person in that church is determined that his lordship will own them? that he will have absolute, absolute authority over everything about you, every attitude, every action, every word, every step. He has absolute authority over. When that happens in the life of a church, watch out, because life is going to happen. It's going to happen. And by the way, when it happens in your life, and when it happens in your home, and when it happens in your marriage, when it happens with your children, and then we congregate, 
on a Sunday, guess what's going to happen? It's called fire. That's what's going to happen. All right. I was reading Leonard Ravenhill this past week, and here's what he said. You don't have to sell tickets for people to come to the fire. You don't even have to invite people to come to the fire. When people see a fire, they just show up. Are you like that? Ever been like that where you just heard there was a fire going on or you saw the smoke in the air and you couldn't wait to follow that, you know, that truck somewhere to see where all those flames are coming from? That happens in the house of the Lord too. Leonard Kilbreth would tell me this. Leon Kilbreth told me this. He said, Bob, in your church, I know that you're, I was young, 30. He said, I know that you're learning all these principles, you know, and you're learning all these diagrams and all these stats and all these formulas and all this stuff. He said, Bob, let me tell you something. Use them, all right? Won't be bad. But wherever the spirit of the Lord is, he will build his church, and it'll get messy. It won't fit your book, all right? But there'll be some things that you'll learn along the way that you'll implement that are strategies and principles. But man, when you get fired up in the Lord Jesus because his fire is laying in on you, then he's going to bless the work of your hand because he directs the work of your hand. So let that be your priority. Seek first the king. Seek first the kingdom. And all of this leads us to what we just read. This, Jesus knew all of these things. He observed all of these things. He was all of these things. And then we get to the fall festivals, the trumpets, is the, the loud announce. It's the, it's the declaration. It, it, it is the signaling uh, that the armies of heaven are calling forth God's children. The atonement time is, a, is, the, is the fiery furnace, the wrath of God being poured out. We call it the tribulation, the great tribulation. And then, of course, tabernacles. This is what this cup that I mentioned to you is about. Remember, it's after the supper, Jesus had a cup. This is the cup that he's talking about. This is the cup that's being symbolized. When all the, the, the history of the world is brought to the place where God in his perfect plan, as he has described it through the festivals, as he's fulfilled it through his son, as we anticipate it in the future yet to come, that his kingdom will be established and he will tabernacle with us and his dwelling place will be our dwelling place and it will be eternal and it will not be corruptible. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of like that because the air conditioning in my Honda is not working and uh, I, 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 this world just breaks down. Have you ever noticed this? The, the world just breaks down. Everything's just breaking down. You're breaking down. I, and I know you drink V8 juice and you feel really peppy today, but there'll come a time, you know, you're just going to break down. That's, it's, just, it's just what works. That's how it works. But one day God says, listen, when you're with, with me, we're going to kingdom together. We're gonna, you're going to be my sons. You're going to be my daughters. Now, that leads us to this. Can't do that on a projection. All right, so when you look at the four cups here, there are four cups of the Passover. We've talked about these. All right, but let me remind you, uh, th this first cup happened before the supper ever happened. It occurred right, right when they first sat down. It was like toasting an event. It was like inaugurating a get-together. And, and we find this in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, where the Bible says, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out of. Matter of fact, all of this comes out of uh, Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. I will take you out. That's the cup of sanctification is what Jesus knew it to be, and that's, who, that's what uh, Messianics continue to, uh, to, uh, to, to understand, as well as um, um, uh, uh, Jewish folks as well. They don't understand who Jesus is, but they still celebrate these four cups. It means despite of are multiple transgressions that the creator of heaven loves each, every one of us. And we cannot serve him while we are bound in the clutches of sin. No more than the God's people Israel could serve him when they were bound in the clutches of Pharaoh. And so what does he do? He, sep he separates us out from the Egyptians. He separates us out from this world. He separates us out from darkness. And he brings us into the kingdom of his light. He separates us out from our fallenness into his, forgiven, his forgiveness. He separates us out from our uncleanness to his holiness. In Christ, in his blood, in his power, he sovereignly removes everything that shackles a sin-laden slave. He wants us in his family, so he marks us as his own. Why? Why did God, through Moses, say to Pharaoh, let my people go? Remember? So they can go out to the wilderness and worship me. When God sets his finger on you and says, walk out of the darkness into the light, 
walk out from death into, into life, what he is saying to you is the same thing. Come worship me. You can't until now. You can't. Oh, you can be religious. You can, re you can read great books. You can talk spiritual talk and understand Christianese and even use some biblical jargon. You can do all of these things, but yet have you been separated out to the place where you know that God has done the separating. So when Jesus offers that first cup of sanctification, it is, the, it is the toast of the coming of what he has diagrammed out through his life that has been delivered to us through God's history books. The second cup is the cup of deliverance. I will free you from being slaves to them. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, once again, we get that word. It means to snatch away. It means to rescue. Uh, uh, Paul uses the very same word in Colossians chapter 113. Listen to this. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Listen to this. Into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Into the kingdom. Out of darkness, into the kingdom. He rescues us. You, you see, one thing about, about people, they have soul ties with with Egypt. See, the, the Lord can take you out of Egypt, but it may take a little while to get the Egypt out of you. And so in order for these soul ties to be removed and these idols uh, to be removed, there's got to be something that, ex that extricates us from the grip of, uh, of darkness. We need to be snatched away. We need to be rescued. Uh, many years ago, I was on my way to William Jewell. William Jewell is like uh, the Samford of uh, Kansas City. I was on my way to William Jewell in a Ford F-250. It was white. It was coming across the highway, and I thought I saw it coming toward me, and it did, and it came right toward me. It was a two-lane, two and I, ha I had uh, my son's um, uh, Dahatsu. Does anybody know what a Dahatsu is? There were only two of them in all of Missouri. All right? there, were ten, there was a tin can on wheels. All right? You could get like 60 miles a gallon. I was all about it, you know? And it hit me head on. I couldn't get out of the way. I couldn't get out of the way in time. And, and there was nothing I could do. Uh, I, 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 looked down, I looked up at the mirror and my teeth were gone. Or most of them. Um, my, my face was bloodied and um, I couldn't talk. Um, I, I, I couldn't move. And, but, but there was an off-duty uh, emergency responder that saw it. And he stopped where he was. And he got out, and he stopped traffic, and he tried to extricate me from the back window, and he couldn't get me out. And so other folks came, and I mean, I was helpless. I could do nothing. I could do nothing. And, and, and once they got me out, it took them a while. They put me on a gurney in the middle of the highway. I don't remember what the highway is that goes from Lee Summit to Liberty, David, but it's that, that highway, right? So I, I'm on this highway. They put me in this gurney. It's in the middle of the highway, okay? And they start cutting my clothes off. Now, I'm getting a little bit queasy about this, man. I'm in the middle of the highway, you know? But I can't talk, you know, because I've, I've, I've lost my ability to speak. And, and, and so uh, my, my mind is saying two things. The first thing is, Charlotte and I did not leave in good terms this morning. Lord, help me live long enough to tell her I'm sorry. That's a true story. And then, and then Lord, please don't, don't let them make me naked in front of this, you know, this, I don't want this. <laughs> but but, but, but the, here's, what, here's what I realized. Here's what I realized. Um, I wasn't in control and I needed other people to rescue me because I could not rescue myself. And by God's grace, I was able to apologize. The first thing we said to each other when we saw each other. Have you ever needed deliverance? Sure, you have. All of us have needed to be snatched out of the clutches and the entanglements of this world so that we might live Kingdom lives, expecting kingdom reward. Third thing, third cup. Now, this is the cup that Jesus mentions here in Luke chapter 22, verse 20. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. He says it's after the supper because this is the third cup. It's normally received after the supper. And it is the cup of redemption. It is the cup that means that I will buy you back with my outstretched arm. That's what, 
Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 says, I will redeem you. In Galatians 3, 13, the Bible says that Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says that you were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, also 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23, the Bible repeats this. Paul says, you were, brought, were bought with a price and you are not your own. And this is the kind of terminology that in the Greek text says something that's more than maybe a slave being purchased out of their, their slavery. It, it, it's, it means even more than someone who's a kinsman, a kinsman redeemer who can buy back for you for, and, and restate you into a family. This is the word that's, that says that God redeems you because he loves you. It's a word that describes compassion. So when Jesus lifts the cup, what he's saying is I will buy you back by the slaying of myself with my outstretched arm, which is the arm of might and power. And then finally, this is the cup that, um, that we should keep in our, 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 our hearts because the Bible says, and Jesus said, I, man, I've, I've really wanted to have this Passover with you. I've been looking toward this. But he goes on to say that um, uh, something pretty interesting. I tell you uh, that I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He's talking about the fourth cup that they're about to receive it is the cup of praise. Now, this is interesting, and there's many things that we could say about it, but it means simply this, that I will take you as my own people. That's Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. I will bring you back to the land that I swore with an uplifted hand to give back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Jesus said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back to take you to be with me that you may also be where I'm at. And when Paul says to the Thessalonian church, he says, and so when that time comes, we will forever be with the Lord. So this is a cup of gladness. This is a cup of joy. This is a cup of happiness. Now, if you look a little bit deeper into the word, you're going to find that the Lord tells us in this cup, in many different places, by the way, he likens it unto a, a wedding feast. And the very first miracle of which the Lord Jesus uh, 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 has recorded in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 2, is at the wedding feast of Cana. And wedding feasts in those days lasted seven days. Okay, so dad, you know, that one night thing, you think it's pricey, wait till it happens to you seven days. Okay? Um, on that seventh day, it was dismissed. But during those seven days, there was celebration. Now, why would Jesus do a miracle at a wedding feast, let me tell you why. Because he was foreshadowing the miracle that you would have when you attended the wedding feast of the bride and the lamb. <laughs> he wanted to show it to you on the up front. And what happens at a wedding, folks? You say, well, Bob, I don't want to talk about some of those things that happen at a wedding. Now, they get kind of nuts. But the truth is that there's a lot of celebrating in there. There's a lot of joy. There's a lot of gladness. Um, I, I'm glad I only had one daughter. I, my my, my father-in-law had five. He had to do five weddings, you know, pay for five daughters' weddings. Oh, my goodness. You know, I, I'd, I'd, have, I'd, I'd have tried to bribe her, you know, say, hey, hold on, let me do something else. What do you think? Um, but, when, but, but when Sarah uh, was planning her wedding, she called me one day. She said, Dad, there's this band I want us to play for, um, uh, you know, my, my reception, and I asked her who it was, and it was a band here locally in, in, in Birmingham, and I said, babe, I, I called them. They're way too much. She said, Dad, ask again. I know some of those folks. They're believers. Oh, I said, oh, so I'm going to put out that pastor card. You know, my, my, the, the, throw out the pastor card. Okay, well, I'm going to throw the pastor card out there. Uh, and she said, and by the way, Dad, this is not a Saturday night wedding. It's a Friday night wedding, and it's going to be cheaper. So, man, I, man, she was working me, man. And she also did something else that some of you southern women know what I'm talking about, okay? When Sarah would ask me some of these questions, she would come see me, and she'd look at me face to face, and here's what she'd say. She'd say, Dad, can I have that prom gown? When she first asked me that, I said, what's up with your eyes? <laughs> she said, uh, Mom told me that when she does that, she gets whatever she wants. <laughs> True story. No, so she just batted those eyes and, hey, we worked out a deal. And, man, when that band hit it up on that, on, on that night, guess what, man? I was, I was in the flow. I was all about it, man. And none of that's on video. You can't find that on YouTube. You'll never, you missed it. Okay? But the, the thing was, man, we, we had a celebration. We had joy. When you read Psalm chapter 23, do you know that's what you get? 
You say, I thought that was just a real comforting passage. Yes, it is a comforting passage, but when you get down to verses 5 and 6, the Bible says that you have set me at your table in the presence of my enemy. You have anointed my head with oil. That's the joy of gladness. And there's some commentators say that's the fourth cup. And the Bible says, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Why? Where's, where's all the days of your life? It's in glory with him, and you're celebrating the great wedding of feast of all time. You are with the king in the kingdom. And there'll be joy and gladness. So today, when we observe the Lord's Supper, do serious business. Examine yourself concerning your standing with God. But I hope that uh, once everything is clean before you and him and your conscience is clean and purified and all is made well, that you could look ahead and say, Lord, there's a big day coming. And I'm looking forward to that day. All right, let's pray. Men, if you'll get in position, okay? Father, I come before you and I want to say thank you for your great love toward us. I want to say thank you, Lord, that you have borne us afresh and anew into your kingdom. We're not the same, that you indwell us, Lord, so we have the king in us and you rule in us, Lord. We want you to rule in this, your church. Lord, we want you to rule in our families and homes because your rule is always righteous. It's always just. It's always good. And, Lord, we want you to rule among us here, this congregation, Lord, to have your perfect way in this, in this place. Because, Lord, we're just passing through. And we're members of the body. Yes, we are. Lord, we're your sons. We're your daughters. But you are the king most high. Oh, so, Lord, I pray today that you help us to examine what you have done and how you've done it, Lord. Some would call it strategy. Some would call it planning. It, it, it's your purpose. You, you fulfilled your purpose. You laid it out. You gave it design. It's, it's undeniable. And so, Lord, thank you for these cups, every one of them. And we thank you for the cup of redemption, what Jesus did when he paid the price to purchase our souls, to purchase our salvation, that he would let out his own blood, his own body being broken. And, Lord, we thank you for what you have done to promise to us an eternal place with you in your heavenlies, Lord, so we don't have to mourn as those who have no hope but, Lord, we can look ahead as those with all hope. I pray these things in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. All right, listen. I've asked, my, I've asked our deacon chairman if it was okay if my son could join me up here at the table because I ordained David many years ago. So, David, if you'll come and stand next to me, they were gracious to say yes. David, we're not going to do anything because they do it all. We're just figureheads, okay? All right, so if you'll just stand to my left. And uh, I'm going to have David pray over the elements before we, uh, we partake of them. But I want you to remember what the scripture says, that none of us are to partake of the cup or of the bread in an unworthy way. Help us not to be, um, uh, Lord, inspect, inspect us. Look deeply in us. And if there's anything whatsoever, Lord, as you search us, that you reveal that is unpleasant to you, that is offensive to you. Lord, we don't want to walk in the blood of Christ. We don't want to crush the body of Jesus all again by our not taking advantage of this time to be right with you. So, David, would you, there's a, there's a microphone right behind you, if you'll just grab it, and if you'll just thank the Lord for the, the body that was uh, uh, broken uh, for us, would you? Uh, please bow with me. Fathers, we're, we're here today. Lord, for one, I'm tired from travel. But Lord, I'm grateful to be here with your people. And Lord, I'm, I'm honored to just be able to, to spend a moment where we pause we pray and we think about what's before us. And Lord, there's a great joy that I hold knowing that you went to the cross. Lord, the hope of salvation that comes from the sacrifice that you made. Lord, when it comes time for communion, my heart is filled with that joy. And I pray that that joy would be here today among all of these people. Lord, also a sense of reverence as we know and acknowledge the fact that it's, it's us. Every person here, we have part of the responsibility that puts you there. And so, Lord, as we take these elements, as we are considerate of what they symbolize, of the sacrifice that you made, Lord, I pray that the joy will, hate, the joy will hold. And Lord, that there will be a mood of reverence and thoughtfulness as we reflect on your role, on the work that you've done, on the hope of salvation that you've provided. Lord, in this bread... Jesus, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
take and eat. Let's pause for a moment and thank the Lord for the blood of Christ that was shed for us. so much about your sovereignty and your planning or the weight that comes with all of the different things that you have prepared ahead of time and the understanding of how much oversight and guidance and love you put into all of this plan. And Lord, as we prepare to take this cup, just one Lord, that symbolizes Christ's blood that was shed on our behalf, Lord, I make the same prayer that you will continue to instill in the hearts of those that know you the joy that comes with knowing that you have made this way. Lord, the, the reverence for knowing that the cost was great and that we're the ones that, that made it that way. So Lord, I pray today as we take this cup that your spirit will be here on the hearts of each and every single person who takes it. Lord, not as a, as a weight Lord, instead as a conviction of the lives that you're drawing us towards, of the work that you would have each of us to do as we follow you on the path of forgiveness that you've made for us. So we pray in Jesus' name.
Jesus said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for you. Drink ye all of it. Church, let's stand to our feet. Join me, please. Psalms 113 through 118 is known as the Hallel, which is another word for praise. During the time that the Lord Jesus and his men would um, were escorted into Jerusalem, they were probably hearing singing from Psalm 113 through 118. And the Bible says that once they had observed this, that they sang as they departed and made their way to the Mount of Olives. So let's do that. And I'll be up here, and Jacques will be as well. And if you'd like to know what it means to be a Christian, maybe this has opened your eyes, or maybe you just need to come and pray. And whatever you need to do, we'll be here for you so that you can know you're being ministered to, okay? But let's rejoice in the Lord. Let's, let's be thankful for what he's done for us. We'll be here to pray with you or encourage you in any way that we can. All right? Go, sir. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. And stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the stone Jesus paid it Holy Spirit is speaking. So Lord, is there anyone else that you're dealing with or speaking to that can have the freedom that in this assembly they would be received and strengthened? Anyone else? Lord, thank you for the good work that you're doing. Thank you for the work that's yet to be done all of which leads to experiencing a touch of your kingdom now and the fullness of your kingdom to come. 
That's my prayer I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, don't go anywhere, okay? I want to encourage you uh, to be back tonight uh, for hymn sing worship. All right, some fellowship afterward. Um, uh, Charlotte and I will not be here. Uh, we don't get to see our kids very frequently, so we're going to take advantage of that. And plus, uh, Adeline, happy birthday. It's your birthday today, so we're going to treat you good, okay? Her mom asked her, what, what did she want for her birthday? She said, I want to go have my birthday with Mima." And didn't even know I was, existed. <laughs> you know. This is how it works, okay? Well, listen, I'm thankful that you're here. How about you take a few moments? Do you need to say anything? You do? Okay, come on. About last year, I decided to rededicate my life. And I think today God spoke um, to me that I needed to be baptized again. And I was saved at seven um, years old. I mean, I think I had the heart knowledge. Um, I had the head knowledge, not the heart knowledge. And after, I just grew. I grew um, <laughs> from a seven-year-old to an 18-year-old. And I just grew in my faith, I think. I, at some point, was realized that God is my Savior, and He is, he, He's my Savior, and He saved me. Yes. And last year, I rededicated my life to God, and I want to live as a godly woman, and I want, and I want to just shine His light in everything that I do, and I, I really want to be baptized again. Amen. So. Amen. All right. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, you know, listen, people have said that revival flies on the wings of testimony. So when you hear good testimony like this, I hope that it opens up all of our hearts. And Elizabeth, you hang tight because there's going to be some people that want to come by and let you know they love you and affirm you, okay? So we're not going to hurry from that. And then, folks, be sure you get a picture, okay? We want you to make sure you have a picture. Um, is there anybody else that wants to say anything? Please say no. All right. Well, then... <laughs> Well, then we'll see you later tonight, okay? God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.